Whatever campus you're joining us at today, whether you're here at Valley Creek or uh, over at Oak Hill, let's wave to our Oak Hill friends, uh, Wakota Ridge online folks. We're all gathered together today uh, for this message as we kick off this new series uh, that Pastor Daniel introduced to us. We'll be looking at um, some theology over the next six weeks and what is our rudder as we seek to follow Jesus in a world that throws all kinds of wisdom our way. And we don't even realize this, but this, this wisdom, it sort of uh, infects us in a lot of different ways in the way that we view God and how we believe that God should be at work in our lives. And so today, if you come in here with, with prayers that you feel like have been unanswered, Uh, If you come in here with a life circumstance that you're really wrestling with, if you're wondering, uh, God, have you abandoned me? God, have you left me? If you're wondering, do I not have enough faith? Have I done something wrong? Uh, Today we find a beautiful answer of hope, of reassurance as we look uh, at the cross of Jesus and what he has done for us there, turning the wisdom of the world upside down. So let's, let's pray as we prepare uh, to kick this off. Uh, Lord Jesus, we are so grateful uh, that you humbled yourself, that you came to this earth, you took on the very form of a servant. We just celebrated this, born as a child, humbly in a manger, not in a mansion, uh, not in a palace, and you didn't live an easy life, but you went to the cross, you suffered, you died on our behalf. We read about it from Isaiah Uh, that you became that suffering servant on our behalf, that you carried our sins for us to the cross. We are eternally grateful. Uh, Let that be the rudder that guides and directs our lives as we always want to come back to you, Jesus, and what you've done for us on the cross. So Holy Spirit, open our hearts to receive this foolish message uh, that I have the privilege of preaching uh, this morning. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So way back when I was a teenager, I guess this was, geez, like 30 years ago now, something like that, uh, my brother got married to his wife, Rachel, in Panama. And one of the things that we did while we were there, and I venture to say there's only one other person who did this, uh, we went water skiing on the Panama Canal. Anybody else gone water skiing on the Panama Panama Canal? Joel Wettstein has, because he was there uh, with me, because my brother is married to his sister. But one of the things uh, that really grabbed my attention were the size of the ships that were making their way through the Panama Canal. And the precision that was necessary for these humongous ships... Uh, To be guided, you can see uh, another uh, ship that's kind of guiding this large uh, container ship through uh, the lock. But once they got out of the lock, how these ships had to navigate their way uh, through the tight narrows and corners of this canal. It was really amazing to watch and maybe even more powerful and amazing than the ship itself is this small rudder in comparison to the ship that actually steers the ship, and it doesn't take much for that rudder to move in order to make sure the ship is going in the right direction or in the wrong direction. And the same thing is true when it comes to us and following Jesus. We have this rudder of, of theology that we don't always see, that, that seems to be behind the scenes, that might be, appear to be small compared to all the other stuff that's going on. In our lives, but that's what's what's guiding us and and directing us. And when that rudder gets off even just a little bit, it has really big consequences in our lives. And if that rudder gets gets off just a little bit, what, what is good theology that actually leads us back to Jesus and all the beautiful things that Jesus wants for us, things like hope and peace and certainty about our standing before God, like we can know that our salvation is 100% secure when when that rudder is directing us right, but if it gets off a little bit, then we can be left wondering, God, God, are you with me? Uh, We can be left angry at God about the circumstances in our lives. Uh, We can be left wondering about our own faith, like is is it good enough? If, If it was better, wouldn't my circumstance 
be different. And, and this beautiful life and peace that, that Jesus wants to, to give to us can be stolen from us. And so as, as Daniel said, we're going to talk about theology for the next six weeks as everybody closes their eyes to take a, a nap. And we want the rudder that is the heart of our theology to be the cross. And so what we're going to talk about is what's called the theology of the cross. And the theology of the cross is a term that uh, Martin Luther, the reformer, he coined uh, in the 1500s as the Reformation was taking place. And just to give you some context, okay, so during this time, the church and its rudder had gotten way off, okay? It wasn't even a little bit off. It was like way off. And so they were teaching things like uh, you could earn salvation by buying things called indulgences. And these are prepayments for your sin. So, hey, you want to go out and commit a sin? You could even buy them in advance. This is a great way uh, for the church to get rich, isn't it? And to have control over people's lives. And so some of these theologians come along and they're like, hey, the things the church is teaching don't really match up to what Scripture reveals. And so there was this movement to get back to the heart of what the Scripture teaches. And in the Lutheran Reformation, there were three solas. Scripture alone, like Scripture is what directs us. Faith alone is what receives salvation. So it's not by buying an indulgence. It's not by being a really good person. You can never be good enough. And thirdly, it's received in faith alone. Like it's a gift uh, that Jesus gives to you because of his grace uh, alone. And in, in the midst of this, Luther to- coined this term, uh, the theology of the cross. And the theology of the cross, it, it emphasizes the cross as the place where we look to, to see who God is and to see how God acts, and to see how God saves. Now, what's interesting about the theology of the cross is when we look at the cross, it's also unexpected. And as Paul talked about, and we'll get to it in 1 Corinthians, and even as we saw in Isaiah 53, it started out with, who has believed our message? Because the message of the cross, it's It's foolish to the world around us. It's God acting in the most unexpected of ways. It's God saying, see my incredible power in what appears to be incredible weakness. And of course, the cross is the primary place where we see this happening, right? It's at the cross where it appears that that sin and the devil and death, they win as Jesus dies, But then he flips it all upside down, right? That it's through the cross that actually life and salvation and forgiveness are won for us as Jesus ushers in what I like to call his upside down kingdom because it's upside down from the values of the world. Now on the other side of the theology of the cross, looks like you're all still with me, this is good, is uh, the theology of glory And the theology of glory, it it emphasizes our own abilities, our own reason, and our own success over suffering, right? Over what appears to be weakness as a sign of God's favor. Uh, Some of you may have heard of this theology, uh, uh, sort of talked about this way, like name it and claim it theology. Maybe you've heard of that. Like, hey, if you just pray hard enough, Or if you just give them enough money, then God's going to bless you. And prosperity in the way the world sees prosperity is a sign that you are in God's favor. Now, the problem with this is it puts the focus on us, right? And it takes the focus away from what Jesus did on the cross. And it makes two kinds of people. It makes someone who's either really proud because, hey, I'm better than everybody else. Look at, you know, I'm, I'm richer and I'm smarter and my life is going better, so I must be doing something better than those people who are struggling. Or it leaves you broken because you are struggling and you have questions and you wonder, and then you think, wow, God has, God has left me. God has abandoned me. And so the theology of the glory expects God to act like the world acts. It expects God's values to look like the world's values in power and success and all those kinds of ways. Let's take a pause here. You're doing really well, okay? Growing up, I want you to picture that kid in your neighborhood who was this 
Mr. Know-it-all. We all have that person in mind, I think. And this person, they, they always had the answer to everything, right? No matter what was going on, they knew the answer and they weren't fr- afraid to say it. And gosh, you could give them all kinds of evidence and other stuff. It just didn't matter. They weren't changing your mind. And it was so annoying, wasn't it? And I remember going into middle school thinking, now we'll get better. You know, we're maturing. Well, that didn't work. Uh, then high school came along, still nothing. College, same thing, full-blown adult, and the world is still filled with know-it-alls. Because that's what the world looks to, right? The world lifts up the, the shiniest, the loudest, the supposedly wi- w- uh, wisest voice. But the cross does something so much different. And it's the point that Paul is making right away in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18, when he says the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Notice there's not any gray area here. It's either foolishness or it's the power of God to be saved. It's one or the other. There's nothing kind of in the middle. It reminds me of the theologian C.S. Lewis who says about Jesus that he's either a madman or he is exactly who he says he is, the Messiah, the Son of God, but there's no in-between. He can't just be a good teacher or a great prophet because the things that he says are madness. So he's either who he says he is or he's a complete lunatic. And Paul's making that same point right here when it comes to the cross, that it's either a message that is total foolishness or it's a message that is is saving us because it's the power of God on display at work in our lives. And it's through the power of the cross that, that Jesus turns everything upside down. And so we are given two lenses in which we can view the world around us. We can view the world around us through the lens of the world that again says power and prosperity and authority and all those things are the things we should value. Or we can view it through this upside down lens that Jesus has given us that says greatness is not found in power, but it's actually found in service. We can view it through the lens of Jesus that says generosity means giving it away and not keeping more for ourselves. We can view it by bringing value to the lives of people that the world says has no value. But Jesus says, I died on the cross for. Now this is a message of foolishness, y'all, and it still is even today. I love in this text how it says, people are saved through our foolish preaching. Like, geez, man, doesn't say much for, you know, the job that we have, you guys, this calling that we've been given, but this foolish message. And no doubt Paul understood how foolish this message was in his context. Uh, This past fall, uh, my family and I had the opportunity to travel with a bunch of you who are here today to Asia Minor, to Turkey. And we saw a whole bunch of these places where Paul went and first preached the gospel. And one of the things that became very clear to me when we were on this pilgrimage was how small Paul and his message were in compared to the glory of some of these cities like Ephesus and Troy and Laodicea from a a worldly standard. I mean, they were modern and the things that they could build, the glory of all of it. And here Paul comes with this crazy message that this person from Nazareth, Jesus Christ, he, he suffered and died at the hands of the Romans, but then he, he rose again from the dead, and now he's calling on all people to declare him Lord of their lives and pledge obedience to him. Paul understood how, how foolish that message was. Right? He, he wasn't saying this is a, a message of, of high society. This wasn't kind of a, a, a new religion just repackaged so that the the really important people could could remain in power and control over all the the other less important people. But this was something completely new. It was a message that had never been, been heard and it was foolishness in eyes of the world then and it's foolishness in the eyes of the world today. And yet God was, was at work, wasn't he? In this foolish message, as the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. No more Mr. Know-it-all. 
Isn't that nice to know? No more Mr. Know-it-all in the world, but instead I'm going to use what appears to be foolish, my suffering and death, to bring about salvation. And Paul, Paul goes on to say these words, since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. Isn't that interesting? We can never know God through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. And it was a message of foolishness, Paul says, to, to the Jews who were expecting signs and wonders. Remember, even the disciples of Jesus were, were saying, hey, when you come into your kingdom, Jesus, can one of us sit at your left hand and your right hand? And they were thinking it was going to be a worldly kingdom where they would be important, where they would take over from the Romans, right? This is what they expected the kingdom to look like because that's what the world looks for. That's what the theology of glory looks for. But Jesus says, no, this is not how I'm going to usher in my kingdom. And to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, it was foolishness because who would suffer and die on a cross? And this idea of, of being raised from the dead? Like even some of you are looking at me like, no, yeah, that, that's a little bit crazy when you think about it, isn't it? I mean, every time we gather, we talk about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So we hear it over and over again. But just stop, pause, and think about how foolish that sounds to the world around us. And yet, the foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Gosh, he's turning everything upside down. And by doing so, he, he's giving us a rudder that leads us always back to Jesus. And not a rudder that leads out to sea. Because that's exactly what the theology of glory does. It's a, it's a broken rudder that turns our attention back to ourselves. It's a rudder that's left so many of us confused about who God is, how he acts. It's left us confused about our own standing before God, wondering about our own faith, wondering, even doubting our own salvation because of the circumstances around us. The theology of glory says you'll be healthy and wealthy and prosperous. And if you're not, there's something wrong with you. And so if God isn't answering your prayers, you must be praying wrong. Or if you're not getting better, then you must be living your life wrong. Or if you're not feeling like you should in your relationships, if they're not going the way that you expect them to go, then, then what, is your, what is your problem? You need more faith. You've got to believe harder. And so it puts all this pressure back on us and we're left broken or we're left really prideful. Because I see some people in this space that are really successful in the eyes of this world and yet have an understanding that it's not because of the theology of glory, it's because of the cross. And the cross always draws us back to Jesus. The theology of the cross reminds us that even in our brokenness, even in our questioning, even in our doubts, even in our fears, we can look to the cross and we can see the answer in Jesus, in his upside down wisdom, in what appears to be foolishness, the hope that he brings to us, that in the midst of our questions and doubts and fears and brokenness and all of that, he hasn't abandoned us, but the cross says, no, he's actually with us. And so when the world says, where is your God? We look at the cross and we say, he's right there where he's defeated death because he rose again in his resurrection. That's where the theology of glory puts us on a trajectory out to sea. The theology of the cross always brings us back to Jesus. Anybody need more Jesus? All of us, right? Even at the Wakota Ridge campus. <laughs> All of us need more Jesus again and again and again. All of us need this reminder that our faith isn't so much about us, right? Get our eyes off of ourselves and get our eyes on the cross, 
because it's at the cross where we see this beautiful upside down kingdom that our savior Jesus has ushered in. It's at the cross where we see our salvation is secure. It's at the cross where we see that yes, Jesus is with us every moment through our doubts and fears and brokenness. It's at the cross where we see the perfect mercy and justice of God intersecting on our behalf. It's at the cross where we get a framework to deal with the brokenness and sin and questions and apparent contradictions that we deal with in our lives over and over again. Uh, One of my favorite professors at seminary is a guy by the name of Dr. Robert Kolb. And he's just like the nicest man. He's got this pastoral heart, but he's so smart and, you know, does all the translations and all that kind of stuff. But he says this about the theology of the cross. Doesn't he just look like a nice guy, by the way? (laughs) You all want to get up there and like hug the screen right now. That's how I felt in class. I didn't do very well, but I felt good about myself. The realism of Luther's theology of the cross is able to confront the horrors and banalities of evil like Okay, banalities. Who, who even knows how to say that word? But he does. Banalities of evil and all their per- perversity because there is no compulsion to find a positive side to what is truly evil or to make God look good. Okay, basically what that is saying is we don't have to look at the evil in the world and try to make excuses for it. We know there's evil. We know there's brokenness because of, of sin. And we don't have to try to make... God look good. We don't have to defend God in the midst of all of the brokenness. Instead, he says, we look to the cross because he looks good in looking so bad on the cross. He looks great as he comes out of a tomb and opens up the way to true human living through his resurrection. He opens up our eyes to the values of his kingdom. Values that are upside down from this world. Wisdom that is upside down from this world. What looks to be foolishness, right? Living the disciple life. Showing up on a Sunday morning when you could be at brunch. Maybe even playing golf. It's still warm with that. It's warm, warm enough. Right? Being generous with all you have received because that reflects the generosity of our, our God. Valuing all people because our God values all people. That's what we see when we look to the cross. And so for the next five weekends, we're going to have a battle going on between the theology of the glory and the theology of the cross as we look at these five different topics, health, prayer, miracles, wealth, and prosperity. And I hope that what we learn through them is to have our eyes fixed on the cross and not necessarily our circumstances to understand our value and our standing before God, that that is signed, sealed, and delivered through his life, death, and resurrection. And so if you've ever wondered about these things, like why didn't God answer my prayer? I prayed really hard. I prayed a thousand times. How come he didn't answer it in the way I was expecting? Or if you've ever wondered, why is my health this way? Why haven't I been healed? Or, or why are there so many poor people in this world? And, and how come I'm wealthier? How come I'm, I'm not as wealthy or, or whatever? Or what is the sign of a, a prosperous life? That's going to be my favorite one the last week because there's this theology of glory that says like leaders like us, the prosperity of our lives in the church shows how faithful we are. And then we're going to look at the life of Paul. I just read it last night in Corinthians with my daughter and her nightly Bible reading and he talked about all the suffering that he's gone through in this life. And so friends, we need a rudder We need eyes that are fixed on the cross because it is there where we have a framework to walk through this life, to deal with contradictions, to deal with brokenness, to deal with sin and hurt and pain that the wisdom of the world will never offer. But Jesus will. So let's pray that our eyes would be focused on him. Father, Give us eyes that are fixed on your son, Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Your wisdom is beyond anything we could imagine, God. 
And you have revealed that in the most foolish of ways, the sending of your son in the flesh to suffer and die on the cross that we might have forgiveness and life as we wait for his return. Help us to live the values of his kingdom, this upside down kingdom, and find true wisdom, not in the things of this world, but in you, Jesus, and the things that you showed us how the, the opposite revealed your strength. May the same be true in our lives as we go to this world with this foolish message of the cross because it is there alone that there is power for salvation, not in the things of this world. Our wisdom will never get us back to you, Lord. And so help us to be people who reflect your wisdom, your love, your truth, your grace, so that others would see and hear this message of foolishness and they too Jew and Gentile would be saved only through faith in you, Jesus. And so may you be the rudder that guides our ship, that guides our lives, always back to you again and again and again, Jesus. Protect us. Protect us from the theology of glory that turns our gaze back to ourselves, that makes us self-righteous and prideful or makes us broken and help us to find our identity more and more in who you declare us to be your children, through faith in your son and what you have accomplished for us on the cross. And so we praise you, Jaira, in all that we do. In your name we pray, amen.